watch every day from 8.30 to 10 to uh, get caught up and prepared for uh, the trading day. I'm really excited about this panel. Um, we are going to talk in a broad way about European financial integration, and I think it's a fascinating topic because there are a couple of myths about European financial uh, integration that at least I, um, who have lived in New York for the past uh, decade, have come to in some ways believe. Um, one is that it's purely for political purposes. We, we are always told it's so that there won't be another world war here. I think there are, however, stronger economic underpinnings for the desire to integrate financially, and hopefully we can talk about that. One of the other myths about European financial integration that's more of kind of a kooky right-wing social media thing, but now that we're all exposed to that, we see it so much, is that European financial integration is a way for the Germans to kind of take over Europe again without firing a shot. Uh, it seems harsh, but a lot of people actually, actually think about that as, as uh, one of the flaws for integration. We'll talk about uh, why that's not true, and ho hopefully we can get uh, some discussion about uh, the, the correct way to communicate financial integration, and then we'll decide how far we've come and how far we need to go. I'll introduce the panel here just very quickly. Uh, I'll just go starting uh, with my neighbor here, Stefano Mikosi, Director General of Asonime. It's a think tank focused on capital markets, uh, corporate taxation, competition regulation. Also a professor, now an honorary professor at the College of Europe, but he taught there for many years and serves on a multitude of uh, boards um, and for businesses, for capital markets, for policy studies. Uh, he has headed the international research um, group at the Bank of Italy, and he was direct, director general for industry at the European Communication. So he'll. Commission. Commission, sorry. And so he'll represent not only, you know, the national uh, uh, side of things perspective, but also the European perspective. Let's see, Elisa. Uh, is right next to him, Elisa Ferreira. I didn't know the actual order when I put my notes together, but she is, of course, the uh, uh, vice governor of the Bank of Portugal. She also was a member of the European Parliament for a long time, 2004 to 2016. She served on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee there, among other things, um, and she was instrumental to key legislation that established the single resolution mechanism and the single resolution fund. So she's been a, a really key player in this, and she can talk about integration from the perspective of now a national central bank, uh, as well as uh, from a European legislative point of view. So particularly uh, valuable. Maybe those two hats uh, are sort of fight against each other once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Sir Paul Tucker. He's a knight, which impresses me. Uh, uh, <laughs> but of course, he also was the deputy governor of the Bank of England. I think uh, very interesting about Paul is that he's the one person here who's not or soon to be not European, right? Because He's British, they're leaving, and um, also he left Britain <laughs> to go to the birthplace of the American Revolution, so they left there. My He's wife is Belgian, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is a professor, uh, a fellow at a Harvard Kennedy School, chair of the Systemic Risk Council there, um, and has served uh, on a lot of, uh, of integral uh, boards, G20 boards, for example. So he has done a lot of work as far as integration is concerned. Um, and it'll be really interesting to get uh, his opinion. He's also a director at Swiss Re, um, among other things. So then we have uh, Ignacio uh, Angeloni right next to him, currently the ECB representative on the supervisory board of the SSM, the single supervisory mechanism. I'm going to try and avoid acronyms as much as possible, but there's so many with SSM, SRB, BRRD, um, and, and I'll, I'm going to establish ground rules in a second so we can try and avoid that. Uh, he started work for the ECB in 98, then he went to uh, the Bank of Italy uh, then in, I think, 2005, and then back to uh, the ECB as an advisor to the executive board before taking over macro prudential policy uh, and financial stability as director general, and he's become, and he's basically uh, negotiated for the ECB to form the SSM, so uh, very integral part of that as well. 
Then we have Jordi Gall next in, the chairman of Kaisha Bank since uh, 2016, but he's been at Kaisha Bank for a long time. He served as the executive director of strategic planning, chief economist there, among uh, other roles. He's also advised the European Commission in Brussels on economic and financial uh, affairs. Um, and he can contribute really from the val valuable perspective of the supervised. I've heard a banker say the supervisory victim. So we'll get his perspective uh, at there. And then we have Dirk Schonemaker, professor of banking and finance. <laughs> Finance at the Rotterdam School of Management. He's also a senior fellow at the think tank Bruegel. He's written a number of books about these things. And I think it's great to get someone from Bruegel because not only uh, as, a, as, a, as a watcher, but also as a judge of how these institutions uh, are doing. Um, some of the ground rules I just wanted to Hopefully we don't all speak as long as I just spoke because we have only an hour and a half. Hopefully we can avoid all of the acronyms because there's so many. And if we want to communicate this to the public in a way that's non-threatening, it helps to just not you know, play alphabet soup the entire time. And I encourage you all to please intervene. So if you, uh, for example, Elisa, disagree with something that Ignacio says, jump in and don't feel rude about it uh, knew, to make this a conversation. Uh, why don't we start with, Paul, I'd love to get your, your take, first of all, on the importance of financial integration in Europe. Why are we doing this? We're all behind this, I guess, and we probably everyone on this panel is for it. Why should we be um, pushing for this broader European financial integration? For two, for two reasons. First, first of all, let me say it's a real delight to the be here. The mi is the microphone now? Yeah, now it's working. Okay. It, it, it's a real delight to be here. Thank you very much to you and Danielle for, it, for inviting me. I think it's my fourth time at a conference in the ECB this year, but my first time ever at a conference about supervision, and I think that's a terrific thing, es essentially for two reasons. Um, because resources will be more allocated, will be allocated more efficiently, um, in Europe, if there is a healthy, integrated financial market, which will help to make the people better off. And most of all, and this is why the Capital Markets Union project is so important, is that it helps to transfer risk. Now, those sound quite abstract, but what we have at the moment is a monetary union without the necessary financial and economic structure um, behind it. And this makes the people of Europe less well off than they could be, and the whole project a lot more precarious than it, than it could be. I hugely welcomed the creation of the SSM. Um, and I hugely welcomed Danielle's appointment as, as chair for two, for two reasons. Um, it's hard in many of the capitals of continental Europe, which are quite small towns, for the supervisors not to be captured even where they are good people and good professionals. And there has been a problem of capture of bank supervisors across our continent for a very long time. And it's extremely hard for people in office to talk about it. And it is quite easy for people like me who are not in office, have that behind us, to talk about it. The second thing, it's tremendously important that the SSM be led by somebody for whom, if I can presume, it is their last job so that and that, when, as you were speaking, Danielle, in responding to the question, do you aspire to be loved or liked by bankers? And I, what I heard and, I, and what I wanted to hear was, no, I aspire to serve and be respected by the people. And you're only free to do that if it is your last job, whether you're the governor of the central bank or the head of supervision. And, and I think the SSM can hugely, in, in slow motion, um, change the integration of financial <coughs> markets. I, I am, we'll talk about it later. I'm concerned by the nature of the national presence on the SSM board, where I think still reflects a degree of, of capture, but overall I think this is good for integration of financial markets in Europe, and I think that matters enormously for the welfare of the people. What, what, let's talk about that now, the nature of the national presence on the SSM. Um, should that uh, Dirk, let me ask you, because I know that you think the national presence in the individual resolutions that we've seen recently um, has been too strong. And uh, what do you think about the national presence on the SSM? Let me first, uh, thank you. Let me first start with two observations. Uh, I think supervision has done a lot. And uh, last year with Nicholas Ferron, I, I looked at the first 18 months of the ECB, and they did a lot. 
But what we see is that integration has not been improving. Uh, and then I come to the national one, because if you look at cross-border flows, I looked from 2014, so cross-border flows between banks, uh, uh, you can measure it on the aggregate level and on the individual level, bank by bank. It's the same conclusion, it is flat. And you would have expected an increase because of the integration of banking union. <coughs> and I think, although the ECB is doing a great job and uh, the harmonization project has been with a lot of vigor, um, I think there are still two captains on the ship. So if you have a subsidiary, you have a local license, and then the national supervisor where you are, even if it's inside the banking union, can ask for capital, liquidity, and you mentioned waivers, but national people cannot really spell that word, so they don't use the waivers. And, um, and I think it is not only about rules, it is really about uh, two captains on the ship. Because there are two schools of thought. We can solve it by more harmonization. I think we can only solve it by getting one captain less on the ship. So uh, make it truly European and having European decisions and uh, keep, uh, get the nationals out of the equation because we have a single jurisdiction now in the euro area. <coughs> That's very controversial. But uh, so I think it is really, uh, we need one captain, not two captains on the ship. Uh, let me, let me, I, I want to also, uh, I want to hear from Jordi as someone who's, you know, chairman of a, a, a national bank and also from Elisa who has an opinion on, on waivers as well. She can spell it, I'm sure, but I don't <laughs> think she's for it. First, let me ask Jordi no, about the flows. No, no, I wanted to, to go back to the issue and is related to, the, to this, to the issue of, of integration. I mean, we economists know from many years, it's already well known that, uh, Integration is on net good. There are welfare gains to cross-border financial services and to the freedom of establishment. But we also know that whenever uh, you have opening up an integration of previously isolated or autarkic markets, there are winners and losers. So we know there are redistributional problems. And this is true in other industries and also in financial services. So it is not at all surprising that in the process of European banking integration, we observe huge resistance from national member states. Now, whether it's unless we have additional political integration, it's very hard to get one single captain. And the same happens with regard to the other argument that favors European integration. We want to have financial integration in order to better distribute financial risks in the marketplace. That is true, but uh, citizens in Europe would like to see quite often not only private redistribution of risk, but also some degree of public redistribution of risk. And uh, that is missing. So it is not surprising that it is hard to get the ship going because there is no agreement between uh, the overall uh, the, the, the single jurisdiction and the national jurisdictions and the national jurisdictions, and I'm sure Elisa has a, a view on that, have uh, the national politicians and the national jurisdictions, the national regulators have, of course, a local constituency uh, with uh, preferences which may not be exactly the ones that uh, correspond to the single union, to the whole union, and, and it is hard to move forward integration on, the, on this basis. But let me, all right, then let me get Elisa's take before we get to Ignacia's response, because you have a national constituency, but you also served on the European Parliament and are obviously incredibly pro-Europe. So how do, you, yes. uh, how do you balance those things? I have been and I am. Um, but first of all, let me just uh, leave a note of compliment for this discussion, because I think it's important that we discuss a project that is very complex and that we have moments where we discuss what we have to fine tune eventually. And I think we have got fine tune a lot of things. Secondly, let me praise, because now I'm part of the board and I am proud to be part of the board, the work done by Daniel, by Sabine, and by all the staff, because uh, in, uh, in uh, three years we did, we did an immense amount of work. But having said this, uh, I agree that we, have, we should, ideally, have one captain. 
but one captain is a captain for the good times and for the bad times. Uh, what we have in Europe is not a banking union, it's half of a banking union. Banking union has three pillars, we just have two. And this is like a cake half-baked. Yeah. A half-baked cake can be really, really very bad for your health. So, uh, okay, I agree and I was listening to Danielle and she knows what I think about it. She was praising uh, the, the mergers and the merger of, uh, I mean, and the, the consolidation of uh, BPI in Caixa Bank. Mm -hmm. And I speak here with the, under the control of my good friend, Jordi, Jordi Gual. Uh, yes, nevertheless, God forbid, but if, if anything would go wrong with Caixa Bank, if you had to wind out the bank, just imagine, God forbid that. But okay, let's put in theory, let's put in theory. Because uh, we faced Popular, I mean, we saw what would happen. What has happened? In the case of Popular, you have the supervision is done at the level of SSM. The resolution is decided at the level of the resolution board. But then if it happens that you have to, I mean, you go into a wind down situation and you have to pay for the guarantee of deposits, then you have a bill that you send to the Portuguese taxpayer and you had nothing to say, or you had very little to say. Not, there is no proportion between your capacity to decide and your responsibilities and liabilities. So before we have this alignment of liabilities and responsibilities at the European level, we cannot think that a national supervisor can be comfortable with a subsidiary that operates in your country, that even if it is a small one, like in the popular case, but in practical terms, the covered deposits amounted for 2.2 billion, which for a small sovereign is not easy. In the case of uh, Caixa Bank, BPI has more than 12 billion of covered deposits, and it is absolutely unacceptable that you have this mismatch. Can I, can I, I feel that he very much in a catch-22. Because when I speak to my German and my Dutch friends is, well, we cannot have European deposit insurance as long as we have the national features. They should have said it before. Right? Yeah, yeah, and you say as long as we have the, or not you, but in general, we, as long as we have the national features, we cannot have European deposit insurance. So we will never get there. Because Okay, uh, but the then we cannot have waivers on capital. We yeah. cannot have waivers on liquidity. Yeah. We cannot have a complete centralized way of addressing yeah. uh, the, the yeah. supervision and resolution, we have got to live with the present situation. Yeah. That's the life we have. Yeah. So we are stuck. We are stuck in the middle. We have got to move. Yeah. But we cannot pretend that being stuck, that we, are, we have a, a full thing. Yeah. And the other element is that at this stage, I'm sorry to address this, but when we talk about NPLs, we are in a competitive world in which a considerable number of banks that manage the NPLs through bailouts before 2013, the banking communication of August 2013, and then the BRRD, so they did it before, so they are now fresh run and yeah. kicking, uh, competing with others that could not for several reasons do it or didn't do it, and now we are, so the way you manage the new legislation is another element that comes with this half, half of the bridge situation. So unless we move forward, and here I would make a caveat saying, uh, I don't see, I don't see the, the, um, the common deposit guarantee as, uh, as a, a risk sharing issue. I see it as a risk reduction issue. Because if you don't have it, the way you have managed BRRD with 8% minimum bail-in, you are bound to trigger a bank run at any moment. And then resolution becomes much more expensive. So uh, I think we need to go to fine-tune this situation, but we cannot have the best of both worlds. Eh? Uh, that's, that's the question. Ignacio, what, how do you respond to that? I mean, these are issues that you grapple with on a daily basis, obviously. First of all, Matt, thank you very much for helping us in this debate. I, I'm hearing a lot of skeptical voices. We are stuck, uh, no progress. Let me, let me speak on behalf of the glass that is half full. We need to understand what we are after. What is financial integration? To me, concretely, financial integration is 
law of one price, same conditions for lenders and borrowers and savers roughly everywhere in the area, once you adjust for risk, obviously, but also risks have to converge, otherwise prices are very confusing. So law of one price and a sufficient amount of cross-border business happening. Why do I say sufficient? You don't necessarily need to have you know, in all segments of the markets, people investing and lending in one country or the other, certain markets are inherently local. I mean, a, a, a Portuguese saver can deposit its funds in Latvia. Most likely, he will not do that, but not because he cannot do that, because it's not practical to do it. So what did we see after the, we have to look at the last 15 years or so. So what we see after the euro, we see the huge, quick, massive integration of money markets almost immediately. Interbank markets, I mean, the, 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 the cross-border ratio of this is about 50%. So it's huge. It's massive there as well. Deposit market, which is normally local, if you calculate the ratio of cross-border to total, uh, you take an average over the area, it's about 26 27%. This is huge, if you think of it. About half of it is within the euro area. The rest is from outside of the euro area, which is a good thing as well, because it means people from outside the euro area depositing their funds in euros in European banks. The lending market is a little bit less. The retail lending market is about 10%. So, but, but, but that's sufficient, because when markets are potentially contested, it means that competition exists anyway, even without a mass of cross-border flows, you have an integrated market. So this has been, I think this has been achieved. Largely, uh, there's progress to be made, but that definitely, I mean, if we look at the relative to 20 years ago, there's been a massive change. What is difficult to sell, I find, is the, is the message, is the communication side of it. Uh, the ECB has been engaged for a number of years. We have a data set, we publish a report, and all this, but it's a very difficult message to sell, because first of all, European in banking integration, so we have Europe and banks, there's a lot of skepticism nowadays about both notions, Europe and banks. So you have to overcome that. Plus, it's a technical thing. You have to explain the benefits. But the benefits are real. So I think all of us, it's, uh, I take it on me also, the ECB, to the extent that this is not effective yet, enough to uh, make an additional effort to uh, explain to the people, to the public, to the politicians, uh, the huge uh, benefits that uh, the common citizen have been able to obtain. Oh, by the way, in your report, um, there's a great graphic that shows sort of the advancement of European financial integration yeah. uh, over, over time. And it initially grew quickly and has since over the last couple of years, as we see this kind of political turmoil as well as populist uh, decentralization movement, um, it's slowed down. Stefano, we were talking about this at dinner last night. Why do you think um, that there's been this big anti-Europe uh, sentiment, this anti-integration sentiment, this sort of move back to populism. And, and why has that slowed are, down financial integration yeah, as well? Yeah, there are, there are um, peculiar features in the monetary union that we have that explain why a major variable in determining financial integration indicators, as you have in the report by, excellent reports by the ECB, reasons why integration depends on political instability. Meaning by political instability that when you have increasing doubts on the future of the union, you see indicators of integration receding. This is what you have. Um, and there is a paradox here. Uh, some people say, before we proceed, we have to clean out all the legacies and have a perfectly balanced system country by country. Then we can integrate. The, what we observe, the paradox is, that, is that as long as there is political uncertainty on the future of the union, the markets will not tend to integrate. The kind of good integration as defined in the ECB reports that we want, that is equity markets, long-term debt markets, uh, um, credit markets, and retail banking integration, recedes when there is political instability. But the integration of those markets is what makes the monetary union resilient, because you have a lot of private risk sharing. Now, political instability, this is the paradox, pushes back 
private risk sharing, meaning, as Elisa just said, that we fall back into a system in which, in the end, if there is a shock, you will need public bailouts. So we should recognize this fact to understand that we must move forward by removing this kind of political instability before we can proceed. And the Commission, in the latest EDIS proposal, has done just that. Because they say, OK, let's forget uh, losses sharing. Let's forget insurance, joint insurance of risk. Let's just do one thing. Let's start the system with a liquidity line that will prevent liquidity shocks from destabilizing the monetary union. And this is their first phase. Notice, we are transferring anyway the power of control to a European authority. So the objection of moral hazard is garbage. It doesn't stand. And once you have this although it's Although it's quite often voiced. I know, but it is not analytically and technically founded. And one of these days, we have to sit down and show that some of these arguments have no foundation. And then, once we have this liquidity line, and we remove the political risk from banking union, then we can work hard on NPLs, on sovereign risk reduction, which is already happening, but without the continuing threat that political instability will break the system. And we can discuss how to do it. This, this ties with something which I believe it's, it's very important. Financial markets all over the world need uh, reference prices. In particular, uh, a key price is the risk-free asset. Okay, the price of a risk-free asset, it's a, a benchmark. And we have built a monetary union where we don't have such a price. Well, there is one, which is the German Bund. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, for obvious reasons, we haven't been able to advance in the construction of, of a proper, properly shared risk-free asset. So well, the minute, because having, the minute, having a national risk-free asset doesn't work for the entire European Well, region. we, I mean, countries which are not Germany, and in particular, of course, countries in the periphery or in the south, uh, have lost access to the risk-free asset, uh, and uh, this has uh, tremendous consequences. Now, if we want to ensure that our system is not subject to political instability, uh, we have to continue on building that risk-free asset, which is, to a degree, shared by all member states which belong to the Eurozone. Eurobond. Otherwise, well, there are several uh, uh, innovative uh, proposals out there, uh, proposals that take into account the legacy issue, uh, and it's important because the legacy affects the structure of the banking systems and the MPLs, but we should move forward. Otherwise, uh, when we get to the new stage where quantitative easing uh, is uh, gone to a degree, the current um, mirage, the, the idea that now we see uh, stability will be gone, and uh, the possibility of another shock to the system, uh, it's, it's crystal clear. To me, when people ask me, what keeps you awake at night, I say this. What keeps me awake is that we have, uh, Kasha Bank is a bank within the Eurozone, it's run with euros and uh, the potential of another 2012, uh, it's extremely dangerous for, for such a bank. Can I make one proposal as a step in between? Because I think Stefano started with liquidity as step one. I would say there is now also momentum for step two uh, between France and Germany to reform the ESM to a proper European monetary fund. As, because if you do liquidity, you need a solvency backstop. <coughs> Uh, and then we can start with European deposit insurance, debt restructuring, and then only at the final stage, uh, we can think of euro bonds, but I would really... Let me just, your microphone dropped. You can yeah. yeah, I would really argue that in addition to liquidity, that we take now the momentum uh, to reform the European stability mechanism as, uh, as a backstop to the banking system and for sovereign debt restructuring, and then we make clear that there's only one captain uh, in Luxembourg, that it's quite clear that if there is a crisis, because I agree with Elisa, 
we need the captain for good and bad times. So only when we solve the bailout issue and the backup, and the better you have organized it, that's a lesson from theory, the less you need it. That's the great news. Uh, so it is right. more the organizing it, like the OMT. We are not using it, but given that it's there, it creates confidence. Paul? So uh, there's something slightly too abstract about this. So the, for me, the single best indicator that there has been a problem with financial integration is that something should have happened and it didn't. What should have happened um, and would have happened in a com completely integrated market is that the strong banks of the north would have opened branches in the countries with weak banking systems in the south. And you would have expected them to do that because they would have absolutely cleaned up, because you would have taken your money out of the local banks and put them in the branches of German banks um, or wherever. And why wouldn't you do that if you were running one of these banks? You wouldn't do that, and you hinted at this, but actually you said it, but abstractly rather than concretely. It's because you would worry that the country in which you'd opened a branch might leave the monetary union. And in the circumstances in which the country leaves the monetary union, your local assets are likely to re-denominate into local currency assets and get impaired because of the recessionary hit. Whereas your liabilities, you are going to have to stand behind denominated um, in euro. And if you think about the, the complexion of, say, the Polish banking system or the Mexican banking system, those are probably the two best examples, and some of us are old enough to remember this, what happened when their crises occurred in the 80s and 90s? Foreign banks moved in because they were safer. And it is a, uh, this, this goes to your concern about deposit insurance. It is some, but it's always cast, this debate is always cast in terms of banking. And the blunt truth is, there is a single monetary policy, but there is not a monetary union. There, most of the money we all carry around um, or use are the deposits we hold with banks. There are 20 monies <laughs> within the European monetary union. There is the money that Mario issues, the notes, but that's inconvenient to carry about. Most of the money we use are deposits held in 19 national banking systems. And I will try to refrain from naming a country, but you could think of big countries and you say, um, if I hold my deposit there for a while, am I absolutely certain to get one euro back? No, you are, well, actually what you're going to get back is one euro times the probability that the deposit insurance scheme and the state behind it will be able to stand behind that one euro. And is that probability 100% everywhere? Absolutely no, it is not. And once you start thinking about it like that, that actually we haven't got one money, we've got 20 monies, um, the questions about banking union and monetary union and risk transfer through some kind of catastrophe, unemployment insurance system, some and eurobonds perhaps, all of these are joined up. And there is a risk today, um, and there's nothing much that the SSM can do about this other than get on with its work. There is a risk today that because growth has come back, thank God, um, that sure. people want to push these issues to the <clears throat> margins. This is based on, you know, there are still flaky foundations, and a recession will come again. And Mario and his successor have much less in the tank. And even if they had things in the tank, the underlying fragilities will, will eventually engulf us. And whether, my country may not be in Europe, but believe me, if it engulfs continental Europe, my country would be washed into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I just want to also point out, sometimes if a country uh, risks leaving the monetary union, the bank actually leaves that country, you know? Or, yes. or if, if, a, if a country, if a, if a region risks, the bank could move on, out, as we've seen recently. But I want to hear Stefano's response to that, because you brought yes, up this point. Yes, the and to, to take the point uh, one step further still, the reason that makes the monetary union such a peculiar construction, the monetary union that you have, is that we have one money administered in Frankfurt and several fiscal and economic policies. And because of that, uh, no one country controls the currency, but they can run divergent policies. And so the simple result of this is that investors will never be sure that the common money will be available to support the sovereign markets or individual countries in case of a shock. And this is what makes this peculiar construction always potentially unstable until 
you cannot provide the guarantee that joint provision of liquidity will always be available. At that time, to the banking system, at that time, the banks become, uh, uh, you don't have any more, they read the nomination I, I, list, I, I, and you get one tie. The banks become the same thing. Now, the question has been, how can we do this without you know, taking up the risk of these damn southerners with all their legacies? And, and the way it is now proposed to do it is let's start a this, so we give the message to investors, but only with the liquidity line. Risk sharing will start later under the control of a European authority. And only when the European authority, so condition alone, approval by European authority. When we come to that point, after another asset quality review, legacy risks will be assessed, and probably by that time gone. So we can play the game of risk sharing. Uh, and here, you have extra delicate, super delicate problems on the role of the European stability mechanism. And the simple thing is that the liquidity lines must come from the ESM. Where else? That therefore becomes the neutral fiscal backstop. Why neutral? Because losses we will leave to fall on national insurance systems until the second and third phase. So there will be no losses from the banks thrown on to the other members of the liquidity uh, support scheme under this approach, which is now the Commission approach. Everybody has said the Commission is backing up. They uh, are now only proposing a liquidity line. But this line of liquidity is the key to take off the table the redenomination risk. Then we can play many other games without only. the fear it's that the yeah. sky will fall on us. But it's, 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 insuffi 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 it's, insuffi it's insufficient. A liquidity yeah. line cannot, cannot be enough. It cannot solve yeah. solvency issues. No, it yeah. can't. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. Because I think this is, this is absolutely, absolutely crucial, what, what Stefan has, has, has said, and that, that connects with, with what was said before, that we have got to, I think we did the most difficult part of the process of banking union, because we did common supervision, common resolution with the entities, and they are, they are running and all this. So what, what uh, my appeal is that we are completely aware of where we stand and that we don't dream that we can do things for which the counterpart is not yet there. But of course, all the progress into the finishing of banking union is welcome. But until we get there, the danger is that by imposing excessive MRL on all the banks, you create, you accelerate the process of, of consolidation, not through the market, but through the regulatory uh, angle. And this is absolutely uh, contradictory with, with what we, we are doing. By, by, uh, by being too demanding on cleaning up the NPLs, is you may create really a, a, a fire sale in the market because you are not sensitive to the constraints under which you are operating. And here just for- uh, for We're a, already at fire sale, right? I mean, we're, we're hearing about assets that are going for 13 cents on the dollar, so. There can't be any Okay, so what, what will be the consequence of that? I mean, even for the collateral inside the bank. So if we really want to create uh, this kind through the regulatory angle, uh, if we want to create this stress on certain banks, and I'm sorry, I make a here another caveat, being completely aligned with, with the general uh, uh, picture that you, that you have drawn, Paul. But please, uh, when you talk about the strong banks of the North, don't forget, that now you can say that, but the, the strong banks of, of the North were massive, bailed out before 2013, and that it was them who created the, most of the crisis through excessive exposure to, Wait, to, can, the, can to the financial just, market. Can I just ask Ignacio, so it's, be, it's, uh, aren't we <laughs> though still much better off now than we were? I mean, Jordi's, what keeps him up at night is that another crisis happens like in 2012, but in 2012 you got on the ball, created the SSM and the SRM, and aren't we now much better off than we were then? First of all, this panel sounds more and more like a heated discussion in a bar, <laughs> which was not intended, but I think it's very good. You know, it's very, it's very, What's wrong about the bar? Very good. That was exactly my intention. I thought that was the purpose of it. <laughs> no, two points I wanted to make. Like First of all, on Paul, I, ag I agree that uh, cross-border branching and subsidiary opening is a very important indicator, and to some extent we are not there yet. But 
even there, glass half full. Uh, French presence in Italy is very large. Uh, Spanish presence in Portugal and elsewhere growing. Italy and Germany uh, bilaterally. So these things are happening. And <coughs> as the banking s system is restructured, also in the small and medium uh, size uh, segments, this is happening more and more. So I, I, again, uh, we, we want to proceed more, but I think this is, this is happening to some extent. Now, in terms of the basket of things to do, I mean, this is already quite full. I mean, things to do that uh, have been signaled by panel members uh, are piling up. But uh, two things I wanted to, in addition to EDIS, deposit insurance, Stefan, Stefano, and also the point of completing legislation and making legislation more homogeneous. That's the point that uh, Daniel mentioned earlier this morning. There are two other things, in my view. One is the single resolution framework. Uh, we have a very good regulation, we have an authority, they're working, but there are things missing. Uh, not so much in terms of instruments, they have the instruments formally, but the funding. The funding of the single resolution board is very, very weak. Uh, there's no backstop and the, the, the fund is, 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 is building up slowly. Uh, so at the moment we are still not in a position in which the single resolution board can be effective. Uh, so we, we, need, we need to work on that. And the other aspect that I would like to raise, not often mentioned, is the competition authority. As the market integrates, you have more competition across borders. So you need a, a stronger, in parallel, you need a strong competition authority to guide because you have more possibility of large players coming in and more competition risk. Now we do have a competition authority in Europe, which is quite strong and very active in a number of sectors, including banking. So far, they've been largely concentrated on state aid control, which is important. State aid control, historically, has been very important. It's still important. But as we build, in banking, I'm talking, as we build European authorities, there's much less scope for states to prop up national banks using supervision and a number of other things. So I would expect the state aid component of the general competition control framework to become gradually less important and the market competition control to become more and more important. And so I, I would expect and I would hope that the competition control arm you know, uh, gradually shifts its focus more, less on the state aid control and more on competition control because that's very important as a complement yeah. of banking integration. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, to express, to continue the VAR conversation, <laughs> to express a bit of it, this dissent, dissenting view on the issue of uh, observing integration of European banking through branch opening and entering into new markets, at least for the kind of business that Casha Bank is uh, at, I mean, which is retail banking. Retail banking, to me, uh, Ignacio, is one of the examples of a, of a market where the natural markets are relatively small. There are barriers to geographical expansion. Among others, you need a substantial market share wherever you are in order to be uh, profitable and having a, a, a large, a, an important brand name doesn't help you unless you have a significant market share in the market. Um, given the fragmentation of resolution and deposit insurance, the funding and uh, equity or liquidity, uh, funding advantages of being in many markets uh, are not there. The uh, scale, economies, uh, uh, scale economies are exhausted pretty soon. You face many jurisdictions with different uh, legal, commercial law, insolvency law, and others. So that adds, adds complexity and removes advantages of size. So we are not observing large increases in uh, cross-border activity in retail banking, small ones like the one at Casa Bank and BPI in a neighboring country, which is uh, for good reason. I mean, to me, I wouldn't expect uh, uh, this happening. It is unclear also that we want at the European level this to happen because then you have uh, banks which may be uh, too large to fail. They might be diversified uh, geographically, but but who knows? I mean, there is a recent study that shows that the investors may prefer to play that diversification investing in different uh, local players which are strong. So I would like to, to put a note of caution on this 
goal of achieving uh, cross-border mergers. But, uh, but I mean, one of the things I was thinking of, though, uh, when Ignacio originally said that, if, you know, when, when I was younger, you got paid for depositing your money into a bank. There were interest payments on those deposits. And I would definitely inv invest my savings in a, did you say Estonia, Estonian bank? Latvia. Latvian, Latvian bank, if I got a better insurance interest rate than I did here, except for the fact that I, the things that you mentioned are very important. Ah. I don't know how the resolution laws work there. Ask, I don't know. Ask Iceland. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but can I make one comparison yeah. to the US? Because um, when the interstate restrictions were uh, lifted, uh, then we got the super regionals, and then quite soon they became nationwide banks. Like, for example, Bank of America started from San Francisco and is now in mm -hmm. one of the biggest right. US banks. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing we don't see yet happening in, in, in Europe, because in, in the US they had the Fed, more importantly, they had the FDIC. Uh, then you're across it a really yeah, nice that's, that's comparison with Nevada and, and Ireland. And so, as a counterfactual, it is possible. So there, uh, the barriers were taken away. And I think what SSM is here doing is a great job. So they are fulfilling that precondition. If we take the other ones also to the federal level, then we can get the Bank of Americas in Europe. And I think that will happen at some which point. Not, which not all national governments would like. But and so, no, there are, and so there's yeah, opposition that's it, that's to this. Yeah. But th that, is, that is exactly the, 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 the point, uh, uh, the crucial point in this. Because it all started, when we started Banking Union, we had this vision of bringing more, uh, basically, more stability to the financial market yeah. and cutting away the link between sovereigns and banks. Yeah. That triggered the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, when we looked at an inspiration model, that the American case was there. Yeah. But, but the Americans started by granting stability to the market, market and trust. That's why the origin of the thing was the FDIC, Federal yeah. Deposit Insurance Company. Yeah. So that then the other banks could, could play hard and become, but, but then the basic trust of citizens in banks was guaranteed through the that. But the states, the states in the U.S. also have a different fiscal regime from the sovereign states. Of course. Well, I think but, both but your points are... But that is the crux of the thing. Uh, and and the, you ha, you, in the FDIC and in the American case, you have a, a credit, uh, an open credit line quite robust into the Fed, whereas here we started by, yeah. super, by risk control, and we are still saying risk control, risk control, whether at the same time, and here I, I agree with the, with the, the proposal the, uh, proposed by, by Daniel saying, okay, we have got to transform BRRD into, into a regulation, but probably we have got to check if it is adequate, independently of the business model, to ask for 8% bail-in before you can s intervene in the bank or do uh, even precautionary cap. Because with 8%, you cut away uh, uh, not only in junior debt, but senior debt, and even deposits. Deposit, yeah. So the, pr the propensity for instability uh, with this legislation and the revision will take place, I think, next year, because there was a review clause because of the doubts. You, do you cannot use the resolution fund because of the 5%, and you have got to bail in uh, uh, independently of the business model. So I think we need to have... A more, more clarity on the vision that we want to, to, to have for, for the European banking system. Because if we, if we, don't, if we just go for, okay, uh, cross-border mergers uh, without any limit, then you, you are killing diversity. You are creating, what, uh, 50 big banks in, the, in 15 years? And, and, uh, and, and did we control, actually, the too big to fail? So I think it is what we have reached is sufficiently important for us to go on deepening the, 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 the thing, but we cannot do it uh, by, uh, without understanding where we are. Well, I think all, all of these comments kind of come back to Stefano's point, which is that you can't have total, obviously, financial integration if you don't have uh, national integration into a f almost a federal European system. You've got to have the political yes, yes. Where, will there before you can get the financial, uh, reach the financial goals that you want to. But the interesting thing I think about the ECB, uh, what I've noticed as a reporter over the last y years covering this, is that the ECB 
has the independence and the agility to move more quickly than the commission, and ought, oftentimes uh, leads Europe in a way. And Ignacio, I want to ask you about if that's <coughs> if that's intended. Is that a, is that a goal that you say, listen, we're going to go ahead and do this work, and then try and bring everyone else along? No, there's no doubt that the financial integration is has been for many years among the strategic goals of the ECB. It's but then you bring the sort of federal Europe that, uh, along politically. That may happen. I mean, we we don't have either the the potential nor the mandate for you know, bringing Europe along with us. I mean, there is a legislature, there is an executive, there are uh, many other things. But certainly, you are right, the agility is, is key, and uh, the importance of our mandate as, uh, as monetary policy maker, which historically brought many things along, I think that uh, gives the potential, I think that gives the potential. But let, let, let me, I, I think one, one conclusion that is emerging here is that the main obstacle to more integration is the link, the multiple links that still exist between banks and their national governments. Multiple links, there are regulatory links, legislative links, financial links, both ways. Banks rely on governments still largely for their support. And uh, the state relies on banks for its funding. Uh, so this brings to the picture the question of right. holdings of sovereign bonds uh, in banks. And th this is an issue that is very delicate, because we know that sovereigns are very important in the financial sector. So you, you want to touch them with a good deal of care. But uh, uh, it is a fact uh, that these exposures have created uh, big segmentation shocks uh, uh, in, the last, in the last 10 years or so after the crisis. And so, so, so from a prudential point of view and also from a more general point of view of stability of the euro area, we need to think about that issue. Uh, we need to approach that issue. I, I know that there are different views. I know this yeah. is delicate, but it, it cannot be an element which is absent from the discussion. Yes. Um, first of all, I don't think we should let uh, the important statement that you made, Jordi, on the fact that there are no good reasons for integration of banking markets. Um, I'm not a banker, and I'm not sure about the answer. But I, while I take your argument about the difficulty of integrating by conquering markets, starting from a national base, I think we should look more closely at the experience of cross-border banks that exist. One is Unicredit, and Jean-Pierre Moustier today is with us. And I think the story there is different. At least in principle, this kind of integration in m and and there is a report in the ECB, there is a chapter in the ECB report on financial integration showing how this activity is uh, basically come to a halt for a number of reasons, but uh, which are not all physiological. Again, um, the issue should be looked at. But th the question is this, uh, cross-border retail banking integration may become one major element of cross-border private risk sharing. So if it is not viable, I think we have a problem. If we Want, if we see the future of this construction with nationally separated banking system, we have a problem, the lingering instability danger. So I think this is a question uh, that we have to examine again. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm ready to share your conclusion. I'm not sure uh, I have sufficient element not to share your conclusion. But I think this is an important element to well, which we should pay attention. Well, I mean, I I mean, I'm starting to get some comments and questions from the audience, and one of them, I think, is pertinent to this. And someone's pointing out the important issue is to decide what clients uh, of these banks need. Do they need domestic banks? Do they need uh, international, pan-European banks? And clearly, a mix. I mean, you have experience with these, no, surely, we, clients that need you to be in yeah, other Yeah, and, but, I mean, one thing is to have international presence uh, and to follow your clients when they are abroad. The other is to have uh, local franchises uh, established in the different uh, parts of the union. 
I fully admit that there are banks which have, uh, have cross-border presence. That cross-border presence was built in previous times. We have to go back to the issue of technology and the way we provide services nowadays. Does it make sense today to open, develop branch networks overseas as, to, as compared to what happened in the, in the 80s or in the 90s or in the 2000s? So, so the things have changed, and a bank that today wants to expand internationally probably has to think about the digital dimension as opposed to uh, doing it physically. Doing it by taking over other banks is, of course, a possibility, but there, uh, some stability on the regulatory front would be most welcome because with uncertainty about the capital requirements, it's also a hard proposition. I wanted to, uh, to also make a, a very general statement uh, on the issue of, um, of the question uh, of the ECB promoting further integration. I think that uh, at the European level, we have already for too many years uh, gone ahead through, with integration through the back door, so to speak. And banking, and we've seen it in this discussion, this is a business where further integration, like B of A moving all across the United States, cannot be separated from additional political integration because of the uh, differences with insurance schemes, resolution schemes, commercial law, insolvency law, you name it. And if we try to push banking integration through the back door, this backfires through populism and opposition to the idea of European Union and an elected officials moving ahead with the agenda. And, and this ties with the other issue, and I'm, I'm sorry, Ignacio, you mentioned the issue of, of uh, uh, <laughs> sovereign risk in the balance sheets of uh, banks. I understand that having sovereign risk in the balance of banks uh, facilitates uh, uh, domestic treasuries uh, funding. I fully understand that. But again, this is a legacy issue. Once again, the countries that joined the Monetary Union and the banks that were working in those countries had a, a risk-free asset. That risk-free asset is gone. Should we, should, should we change this on the regulatory grounds? No, until we have an alternative. Well, yes. And again, it's a political issue. Yes, because they're risky. But again, this is a political issue. It's risky, but it's, it's, it's exogenous. It's an issue of monetary economics. But, but Paul, when it was in our books, it was not risky. It will because, With monetary union, well because, it becomes risky. No, exactly. And so if, oh. some, if something goes from being not risky <coughs> to being risky because of monetary union, it's better to face up to, to that. I think this discussion, by the way, is not making a distinction between branches and subsidiaries. I've, I've been four years out of office, and so I may have forgotten. No, you um, but, I, but I think that a deposit with a branch is insured by its home country. Yep. And the point I was making earlier is the indicator of lack of integration is that the strong banks, well, banks from strong countries, like the one we're sitting in, haven't branched into other countries. And we should think deeply about why wouldn't they do that, because they could build scale really quickly, because what people want, people, customers want all sorts of things, but what the deposit customers in a bank most, want most of all is to get their money back when they want it. And you are going to get your money back when you want it from the branch of a German bank, because Germany's got a massive external surplus and a relatively low um, debt to GDP. And that is not true of other banks. Of other, of other countries. And so the indicator that we should be concerned about is why haven't German banks cleaned up, because their bosses could all be and their shareholders could be richer, they've got massive incentives to do so, unless branching is actually a risky thing. And it is a risky thing, because actually, as you say, I think you and I are in the same, more or less the same place, because of the residual risk that those member states will leave the monetary union and they will have euro-denominated euro liabilities and local currency depreciating assets. And this is an elephant in the room, which you, those of you that are constructing um, Europe, need to face up to. Can I say one other thing about MPLs? Am I allowed to do that? Y yes, well, I have a question for you as well from, okay. the, from okay. the audience. One number on it, because um, I check it always. You see a slide 
increase in branches compared to subsidiaries within the euro area, yeah. so it's going very slow. Yeah. And let's look at the big example of Nordia. Uh, they moved from subs to branch because they were fed up with uh, all the local uh, yeah. issues. So I think the market can take uh, the hand by themselves. If, if, uh, so it is happening a little bit. Very, very tiny. tiny. Absolutely, absolutely. Very little. Tiny. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the position, I think the position you adopt on MPLs is absolutely fascinating because it's kind of, it's rational locally and it's extremely dangerous for the collective and you now have national incentives. So, um, the MPL's policy is a lot better than it was, but it's not great. Um, and I watched your speeches. I watched about two years ago, pretty tough speech. Mario gives a speech, slightly softer. You give another speech, harder than Mario's, slightly softer than your, than your first. And I was sitting in Harvard and I almost wept. Um, and the problem is, that if you don't have, it doesn't have to be fiscal union. It's, now let me make another step first. So the fact that we're not dealing with MPLs is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why these banks are trading at a huge discount, apparent discount to assets, and that's because the asset, the market knows that the assets are not worth um, what they're shown as in the, in the books. This is a terrible place to be. But if you don't have any kind of catastrophe fiscal safety net, dealing with the MPLs, facing up to the fact that lots of these banks are still very badly impaired, could tip the local economy into a recession, pass a massive in economic terms, a massive asymmetric economic shock for which there is no collective um, insurance. And so you, when you, where you were sitting where you were before, you had incentives so we must deal with MPLs and we need some kind of fiscal transfer system. Where you are sitting now, and we've known each other very many years, you have incentives to say, my God, no, we can't do that because I'll tip the local economy into recession and there will be no, no. Um, transfer of, <laughs> of resources. And let me tell you, investors, if everybody in this room disagrees with that, this is what every investor um, from outside the euro area of any significance thinks because it is obvious that there are uh, banks around this continent stuffed full of assets that are worth hugely less, sadly, than their book value. And I think you are doing the very best you can constrained, and I applaud you for it. This is a true you are, um, may I? May I? Please, yes. 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 Um, uh, I, think, I think you have a point. The problem is that I'm not saying that uh, it is black or white. I think banks, and banks are aware of that, they need to get rid of NPLs. That goes without, I mean, there is no question about that. What is the timing? Is it two years? Is it five years? Uh, are you supposed in two years to, to assume imperatives for the stock or just for, for, for the new loans or for the, the ones that, that materialize? So that is, it's the fine tuning I'm asking about. I didn't move from one situation to the other. I think I still have the same vision that I had. I still trust there are ways in which we can evolve from the ESM into a European monetary fund that can actually create the backstop that was foreseen since the beginning in relation to the single resolution uh, fund that was foreseen since the beginning. Also since the beginning, there were, there were elements of stability that were taken at the European level. And the crucial thing now is that we miss these elements for stabilization of the financial sector. We don't have them at the European level. If you, if you find one, you no, tell I'm me. I'm agreeing with you about that. Yeah, I'm there is none, there that. is none. So the crucial and the critical thing is if you consolidate the banking sector, not through the market normal mechanisms, but rather through regulatory pressure. And so if you do it through regulatory pressure, you are bound to trigger a crisis. And the, the instruments that we have f to manage a failing bank, they don't bring stability. They bring instability. Even in that, in that sense, if you look at, uh, at the state aid framework, they, they, they ask for 
private contribution, but they don't go into senior debt. In the, in the, in the, in the United States, you don't see senior debt in danger, uh, even less depositors. So if, if, you, if you have this, this legislation as it is, if we are not prepared to move it and to change it and to adapt it in order that we have certain elements for stabilization of the financial sector, we cannot go that far that quick because that's, that's my argument. So I, I'm very, very faithful to, uh, to, to our common project, but we have got to be very wise and very objective uh, where we stand at this moment. And that's, that's the, the, the basis of my argument. So let's evolve, but let's evolve. And the proposals that were presented by uh, uh, the papers by Bruegel, for instance, in relation to the evolution uh, to create an ESM that tackles at the same time the... the, the uh, there are, I'm not saying that I agree with everything that is written there, but there are strong ideas that build on our common compromises in the past. I mean, they have got to, to be brought forward because some of the work that is being done now by uh, ESM and by the SRM, uh, they don't produce the stabilization impact that we wanted them to just because we miss pieces. We miss a revision of BRRD, we miss uh, the, the stabilization elements of the backstop and the uh, minimum uh, progress on EDISH. And uh, of course, we have uh, a monetary union that is not complete. But uh, people can, it's not easy for the common citizen to understand exactly what we mean by this. But if their deposits are in danger, Let's talk about that. Their savings are in danger. They will understand. That, <laughs> that they will understand very, Let's very Let's talk well about that. Let's talk about just the completion of, of banking union, because I'm getting a lot of questions from the audience on, on this subject. Um, one of the questions I think we, we've already kind of answered, uh, but we did it quickly. Are, idiosyncrat are any idiosyncratic shocks manageable by means of the liquidity lines? No. Is, is this sufficient to control the redomination, redomination risk? And you both have said no, I believe, already. And I said it's a beginning. But it is a beginning. I said it is a beginning. We announced that we are establishing the full system, but we start with the liquidity line. This takes away the risk of a liquidity shock. You can only do one thing at a time. To proceed to risk sharing, we will need more risk reduction, because today we are not ready for that. And this is the key point. Mm -hmm. So my liquidity line is a bridge. It's not the solution. But we need this bridge to move forward because otherwise we are stuck, the as you said. The political tragedy here is that liquidity lines of that kind, which I agree are a step forward, or indeed the target two system, which is an intraday liquidity line, or the ECB operations, are presented as not being, being as being immune from the German and other um, objection to resource transfers. But, but of course, they are contingent resource transfers. That's what a loan is, because people can and I, I feel very depressed, and I've felt depressed about this for years, that no German politician will explain to the German people that, of course, there is a resource transfer system. And the monetary union would have cracked apart into smithereens. It is a contingent um, um, resource transfer um, system. And I actually think there is a moral duty on politicians to explain to their respective publics how the system works. And the reason this matters, the reason the moral point comes in, is that if, if ever there is an absolutely gigantic default and the ECB's capital has to be um, rebuilt, um, Germany and other countries will have to chip up the most. And then people will say, well, why, why, um, um, why is that? And the answer is, well, because you gave them loads of money that you didn't get back. And it would have been much better politically to be open um, about it, in, in my view. Tell us. But we I'm, must I'm... also recognize what I call the paradox. In the system that you have today with fragmented market, you have much less private risk sharing through capital markets and credit markets, and so much greater risk for what you just described. Our equity markets are the key to that. I, uh, so if we reduce the risk of redenomination and move forward, we will have greater integration of private markets and greater risk sharing building through private markets. So we are exactly doing what our German friends would love, but they are blocking this 
progress. L let me ask Ignacio a related question that we get uh, from the audience as well. W what we're talking about here is Euro a Europe, uh, the different Europe's running at different speeds. Someone asked, what will a Europe of two or more speeds mean for financial integration? Um, is that completely unacceptable to you? Is that not within the way? Is that not uh, part of the framework of your thinking in in the SSM? And and the and the question continues. Can you imagine an EDIS, which is a guarantee, common guaranteed insurance uh, deposit insurance, for a small group of Euro area countries? Ignacio, I'm expressing my own views here. I, I think the idea of multiple speed Europe is already in the facts, and it is increasingly in the facts. I mean we have led for many years with the Commission uh, um, giving us a, a, an objective in terms of, Euro, of European Union integration. So including the countries that belong to the Euro area and including the countries that don't belong to the Euro area. Now with the recent developments after the crisis and with Brexit, I think this is gone. I mean the main project is clearly the Eurozone. Now the question whether we should have multiple speeds in the Euro, Eurozone, I think that's not possible. I mean, the fact that yeah, there is a right. single currency brings everything right. else together. Otherwise, the disagreement is too right. strong. Yeah. So there we have the big project that, yeah. that this is what we are talking about. I hope I don't agree on that. <laughs> the issue, the issue we, co we are confronted with is the fact that in order to build a truly resilient Eurozone, as we have seen in this debate, we need further political integration. And we face the resistance of non-Eurozone countries. One of them was Britain, no, Britain we is we gone. We were very keen on further uh, no, no, no. integration. Uh, yes, we were. Not yes, on, we not were. on Eurozone, not on yes. Eurozone. Yes, yes. Eurozone yes. integration. Yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, I've it been didn't look this when, way. I've been present when our former prime minister has talked to other prime ministers about it. We were well, extremely keen for further deepening of the Euro area for many, many years. All right, that's a I'm surprised panel. to hear that, but... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 the British, no, no, the British government, successive British governments. It is not in the UK's interests for the Euro area to be fragile because it is next door to us. And we made absolutely clear at the most senior politically level many years ago that we favoured much deeper integration, even though that would create a massive power on our doorstep that would be uncomfortable in other ways. That is absolutely... What you say is just not right. Okay, I'm not going to argue on this, but we face now the opposition of other countries, certainly Poland, to give an example. That's true. Although I may be, I may be uh, also opposed on that uh, by someone at the audience, and, and the Swedes are not that happy, I understand. So that will be, to me, a critical point. To what extent is the European Union allowing the two-speed to go ahead? Uh, well... Someone just, just says, how can you talk about uh, EDIS, e the, 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 de the sure. deposit scheme, um, without recognizing the real problem, the unlimited coverage of German deposit insurance? Oh, the, the small uh, savings banks. and uh, yeah, I think in the end, um, there are two issues uh, on the two-speed, because one issue on the two-speed is significant and the less significant banks. Uh, and if we go ahead, because I think... The good news is when uh, the SSM regulation was designed, of course, we have to split significant and insignificant banks. But when it really matters, like a license, or you do a merger, or you do an exit, and it's like going to church. Eh? You nowadays only go to church uh, for being baptized and marriage and when you die, and not every Sunday anymore. But at these moments, they go to the ECB. Um, so that's very important, then there is no distinction between significant and less significant uh, banks. And in that sense, I'm a strong uh, in favor that EDIS would apply to all banks, significant and insignificant. And in that way, you would get rid of that uh, certain local are promising full amount, but I've never heard who's behind these local uh, reinsurance schemes on paper. Uh, they are self-reinforcing, like a group of savings or cooperatives, but who is behind it? That question is not answered. And by doing properly EDIS with uh, the ESM or a refined ESM in the European Monetary Fund behind it makes the Eurozone extremely stable on the banking front because the, the better you have organized it, the less often you have to use it. And then we get rid of the, on paper, unlimited insurance, but just the 100,000 for 
all Euro area By citizens. the way, I think church going is probably a little different in Holland than it is in Spain or Portugal. Okay, so yeah, there's, okay, sorry. There's still not... <laughs> I'm ahead of the game. There's no European <laughs> church integration yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 please. You, you are suggesting... Uh, I, I, I didn't completely understand what you were, you were saying that... Uh, uh, Less significant banks should create a sort of uh, no. IPS across in other countries so that you, you have this kind of private or voluntary no. contribution and you don't trigger BRRD. Or no, no. I, I, I propose that the less significant banks also become part of EDIS. So we yes. should get rid of the private... But they don't have to get rid of the IPS, uh, of, the, of the private. The, it, that's something that goes on Makes top? makes it clear and just have one scheme because all these intermediate schemes and these private schemes are not helpful in the discussion. Yes, but it helps them not to have uh, bailed in, uh, massive bail-in when they get into trouble and that's that's the crucial and they, thing. And, and, and that's the reason why small banks are in trouble. If they if they get in trouble, they become systemic because uh -huh. you... The, uh, most of them, they don't, they don't have bail -inables. I mean, they don't have uh, junior yeah. debt and so they... Uh, but most small banks can uh, be resolved yeah. through a standard purchase and assumption technique mm -hmm. where you transfer the deposits and whatever assets are good to so another So you are saying that, to, the, to that another, MREL and bank. BRRD should not apply to the, them? The, 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 the directive mm -hmm. um, added ambitious components to the G20 plan that I chaired the group that produced. So is, what you mean is that BRRD and MREL should not apply to small banks? I didn't put it as strongly as that. <laughs> that's that's the obvious conclusion. From oh, uh, can I? We're, we're doing a horrible job at avoiding the acronyms, and I'm guilty of that as well. Oh, sorry. It's, that's well. No, no, no it's okay. Um, I think we're we're all right with SSM and SRM and EDIS. I think is skirting, but we get a little bit. Uh, BRRD maybe is a little too much. Now I have one that even I don't get. Someone says, rather than, and Paul, I'll put this question to you uh, because you, you, you kind of brought this up. Rather than wait for banks to venture beyond home markets, why not focus on creating products like a commonly insured European ISA? I'm not sure what ISA is. Does anyone? I, I think, so this is an investment. Go on. Go on. No, no, go, no, no, go on, go on. Microphone. Microphone. We've got one currency but 20 different forms of money. But rather than look for banks to provide the solution for that by venturing out of the home markets, why not perhaps um, look what you can do from a more consumer-focused point of view? So offer a common European savings product that all banks could offer but is commonly insured or perhaps do something like create a credit passport, for instance, that people could have their financial data on and use it to access services throughout Europe because it's very difficult to go and open a bank account in Latvia or to open a, an account in, in Spain, whereas if you had something common that you could just carry with you in your, in your purse or your wallet, I think that would help integration in a way that would be very obvious to people. So I think, I think, um, I, I think it's important to distinguish in, in this debate about deposits money <coughs> from the other services. The other services all matter, but they don't have this kind of existential element that kind of banking collapses can bring about. And on that, the first thing you said, we, you know, it would be a kind of Trojan horse, of course, but we're all in favor of Trojan um, horses. Um, <laughs> a kind of ISA type thing that was mutualized, um, if that was a way in to that. I mean, in a sense, I mean, I, I can say this because I'm not in office. Those of you that are need to find a way for Germany to back out of a policy that is not actually in the interests of the German people over the medium to long run. And people don't like, no one likes losing face. And so they're not going to pop up and say, oh, by the way, we didn't analyze our own interests correctly. And so we'd like to change, um, change course. The kind of thing that you describe, and maybe other things that have similar characteristics are a way of, in slow motion, kind of changing the trajectory. My, my response to this goes to our debate. The, the debate between you and I, really, is about um, the, the pros and cons of forbearance. And forbearance, in, in, a, in a normal monetary fiscal union, um, forbearance is a really, really stupid thing. Um, and I, I've, I've seen people do it. It's not a completely stupid thing in the circumstances in which many European um, countries, Euro area member states find themselves. But it is still a gamble. 
that part of forbearance doesn't um, go away. And so if forbearance is, is the default strategy, it is immensely important that at the same time that you're trying to find these Trojan horses that can lead you to a more secure place. Because the risk is that growth will not raise the boats up, and actually you will end up with a horrible um, economic downturn um, a few years hence. And the people will say, These, this project just does not serve our interests, whereas, of course, it can serve their interests. It is only because it is poorly designed that it doesn't serve their interests. And that it is poorly designed is not their fault, for God's sake. It is the fault of the elite. I want to get back quickly to the, uh, the cross-border discussion uh, as, as far as bank consolidation is concerned. And just ask you again, Jordi, I mean, um, Madam Nui said she's optimistic that we're going to start seeing real cross-border consolidation in 12 months. That was, I think, a very optimistic statement from her. She's left now. Um, so do you actually see that happening? Does it make any sense to you? I'm not asking if Kaisha looks at uh, other targets outside of the Iberian Peninsula, but does it make sense? <laughs> uh, I have to say I don't see it happening uh, in a strong way in the coming 18 months. Uh, I see that uh, part of the case for um, cross-border mergers is still not there because of all the political restrictions that I just mentioned. I have to say that we went through uh, an M&A, a cross-border M&A that Madame Nui mentioned, and we acquired BPI. Uh, it took us two years and a half uh, to finalize the operation because of voting caps and whatnot. I mean, the market for corporate control at the Eurozone level, it's still not uh, uh, an integrated market. And there are, as I said before, domestic legislations and rules which prevent uh, the easy uh, access, uh, the easy acquisition of uh, interesting targets. It took us two and a half years, and we had been in that bank for 15 years with a substantial share of the, uh, of the, of the bank, 44%, in fact, during the latest years. So uh, it is hard. I think that one of the and yet key we and yet we hear reports of, for example, yeah. BNP Paribas we or Unicredit well, I mean, being interested in Commerce Bank. Newspapers publish lots of things, right? So you know about that. <laughs> so there are rumors, and there might be rumors. Now, uh, what I want to say is that uh, we've heard this issue, and the central bank has said this repeatedly, and the supervisor also that ba um, that Europe is overbanked. Now. Uh, one way to reduce the size of the industry and to extract synergies and to reduce uh, branches and to reduce employees and to increase efficiency is to avoid uh, overlaying of branches and employees and therefore domestic restructuring, even if from the point of view of integration we don't see it as, as making progress, it actually makes progress in terms of reducing NPLs and uh, increasing the efficiency of banking systems. And that's what I see happening. Now, moving to this beyond to the second stage and getting to the B of A, I think it will happen when we have additional political integration that solves some of the issues uh, that we see uh, with resolution. And the political and, drive. And it will, it will take a few years. And by that time, I doubt it will be through conventional banking because many of us will be working not in banking institutions, but in plat what I call sometimes platform banking. You'll be working for John Cryan's robot teams. <laughs> we'll uh, let, let me get back to also to the NPL issue, um, Paul, because you brought this up earlier. And someone in the audience yes. right. points out a price to book value at Barclays of 0 0.5, at RBS of 0 0.6, at Standard Point Charter of 0 0.6. Are they insufficiently impaired? What so, so I, it would be really nice These are not if people the identified themselves. But um, so actually, I, I think there I chose my words carefully as well. I said it's one of two main reasons um, why you can get a discount to, to, to book. The other reason, of course, is um, a business model that doesn't generate um, earnings. Or in at least one of those banks, they effectively have impaired assets through the kind of um, litigation um, um, overhang. But but. Were you to um, point out, oh, all the UK banks are in a mess too, um, that doesn't invalidate what I said about it's kind of, you know, cheap shot. Mm. Well, 
question. No one signed the uh, question here. Just getting these little. Yeah, that's, that's, I was hoping <laughs> someone would raise their hand, which is the normal. Yeah. Kind of more used to that, really. Why don't we? Uh, I think we've pretty much come to the conclusion that the political will needs to be there for further, uh, for further financial integration. Ignacio, do you think that's the case, and do you see it coming, or what? What are your hopes, say, for the next uh, two, three years I've, of your work? Two or three years is more difficult. I was going to say Five, it's ten. really in, in the cards in the very long run. I mean, this mm -hmm. continent is too integrated in so many ways that the only strategic direction that makes sense is to rationalize and integrate all the rest. <laughs> now, <laughs> it can be very bumpy in the process, but you know. That's where certainly supervision is moving in that direction, and politicians are, get, I think, hopefully increasingly convinced, and that's the way to go. And in the meantime, please be careful. <laughs> that's my, that's my I, word. I would in the add, meantime, I would be add careful. here that uh, the window of opportunity seems to be there now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If exactly. Macron yeah. can really yeah. find an yeah. interlocutor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we don't do it before the end of this legislature, I think we are in for big bumps. Exactly. Yeah. We, we have, and don't wait for the next recession. Because we will go yeah. through then uh, yeah. exactly the, not only the next recession but the end of QE. Yes. Exactly. And other, yes. of other developments. Yes. So yes. Uh, and maybe yes, in the long run yeah. there is no alternative. Uh -huh. But I think the game should be played in the coming six months. Exactly. That's exactly what happened yeah. last time because the 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 SRM there was some difficulty about how to build the resolution fund. And in the end, uh, Parliament got a lot of power uh, against Germany to make it because it was the end of the legislation. And that time, a good deal was, was made because we complain it is too slow, but it would have been slower without that deal. So I think the end of yeah. the legislative area, that is the time to... to uh, because then Parliament is away, nothing happens afterwards. So there that is an, can help. Another thing that people, are, I think, have not fully realized, that the project is to integrate deposit insurance and resolution and to build the European uh, uh, finance, what is the name of FDIC, uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Insurance so it's one authority <laughs> under which we want to bring uh, uh, all controls, one authority that is already established, yeah. that has shown its teeth in handling the first resolution exercises. Yeah. And I keep on repeating this because yeah. people seem to overlook. We are talking of bringing the matter under the control of an established European authority. We are not talking of leaving free hands to the you know, rotten banks of Southern Europe. Mm. And this point keeps on being overlooked. Mm. Uh, there is no more al -Azad because there is no open risk implicit in this transfer of powers because every transfer, every single decision of intervention by the Edis will be taken by this European authority. I don't think it's a secondary mm -hmm. aspect, but people seem to overlook. Institutions matter. Excellent. And I think agree. The bottom line is, I think that we've just established the glasses more than half full because of the tireless work of Elisa, of Ignacio, of Danielle, of Sabina and that we need to seize the day in order to fill it up. So thank you very much for the panel. I think it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.